Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of the Napa Valley Halloween murders? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Adrian Michelle Insania was born on December 30, 1977, and raised in Calistoga, California. This is about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. In June 1994, when she was 16 years old, she encountered boys from her school and allowed one of them to drive her vehicle. He was only 15 and did not have a driver's license. He drifted onto the shoulder of a road and then overcorrected, the car rolled at least three times, and Adrian sustained massive head trauma. Afterward, her grades plummeted, and she was depressed. Adrian was treated by a psychotherapist and made significant improvements. She graduated from college in 2001. She moved to Napa, California, and found a job as an assistant engineer at the Napa Sanitation Department. In February 2004, she moved into a rented house on the 2600 block of Dorset Street, along with a roommate named Lauren Minza. Lauren was a volleyball coach at a local community college. In June 2004, a third roommate moved into the house. Her name was Leslie Ann Mazzara. Leslie was born on August 1, 1978, in Orlando, Florida. Later, her family moved to Anderson, South Carolina. She was a beauty queen and won several pageants. Leslie graduated from college in 2003 and in early 2004 moved to Napa, California. She found a job in the sales department of a local winery. Adrian's best friend was a woman named Lily Prudham. Lily had a boyfriend named Eric Koppel. They had been engaged and were supposed to marry on November 1, 2004. Something went wrong and Lily canceled those plans. However, the couple was still together romantically. Lily planned on traveling to Australia with Adrian on November 25, 2004. Even though Adrian had exciting plans, Leslie was the roommate in the Dorset Street house who stood out as far as being adventurous and outgoing. She had several potential romantic partners, including two boyfriends. Some of these men were extremely eager to spend time with Leslie. She was able to attract men without any effort. On October 24, 2004, Leslie had a man over to the Dorset Street house at night. She and the man engaged in sexual activity, which kept her roommates up. This led to a house meeting, but the women agreed that it was fine to have men over to the house. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Stamps.com. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years with easy access to USPS and UPS services and premium rates for all your postage needs. The holidays are hard enough. Make things easier than ever with Stamps.com. If you mail or ship often, let Stamps.com do the hard part for you. Simply print postage and shipping labels right from your home office. It's ready to go in minutes. No long lines or complicated setup required. Now taking care of orders on the go is even easier with the Stamps.com mobile app. If you need package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping are covered this holiday season. Sign up at Stamps.com slash Dr. Grande for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash Dr. Grande. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On October 31, 2004, Halloween night, Leslie Mazzara and Adrian and Sonia went to bed at around 10.30 p.m. They slept upstairs in different bedrooms. Lauren Minza went to bed at around 11 p.m. Her bedroom was downstairs near the back of the house. She was accompanied by her dog, Chloe. 
Before going to bed, Lauren locked all the doors, but she did not check any of the windows. Sometime after 1 a.m., now on November 1, Lauren was awakened by her dog growling and barking. A motion sensor had turned a light on in the backyard. Lauren figured that it was one of the local cats and went back to sleep. Shortly after this, she was once again awakened. This time there was noise coming from inside the house, near the front door. She thought that it could be one of Leslie's boyfriends looking to have a sexual encounter. Lauren tried to go to sleep, but then heard a noise in Leslie's bedroom, which was right above her bedroom. The noise then appeared to move from Leslie's bedroom to Adrian's bedroom. This didn't make any sense to Lauren, but then she thought that maybe the man was using the bathroom upstairs. Lauren then heard noises consistent with a bed bumping up against a wall. Naturally, she figured this could also be explained by sexual activity. A few minutes later, Lauren heard a scream, which was clearly Adrian's voice. Lauren still believed that sex was an adequate explanation for the behavior, even though Leslie was the individual who was supposed to be having sex, not Adrian. After hearing a second scream and the sound of a struggle, Lauren realized that something else was going on. Lauren found herself in a terrible situation. She wanted to assist her roommates upstairs, but she was afraid of being attacked. She stepped out of her bedroom and moved to the base of the stairs, where she listened for about 30 seconds as Adrian was being attacked. After hearing the intruder start to come down the stairs, Lauren ran outside to the backyard patio, trapping herself as there was a fence surrounding the backyard. She could hear the intruder exiting through the front window of the house. The only sound left that was coming from the house was Adrian crying. Lauren entered the house and retrieved the phone in the kitchen, but there was no dial tone. She walked upstairs to check on her roommates and found that they had been stabbed. Lauren went downstairs, retrieved her cell phone, and called 911. She told the operator that an unknown intruder attacked, and both her roommates were hurt. Lauren was frightened of where the intruder might be. She disconnected the call, grabbed her dog, and entered her vehicle. She drove away from the house and once again called 911. Lauren kept driving in the area around the house as she was on the phone with the operator. She was so frightened that she refused to stop her vehicle until the police arrived at 2.13 a.m. A few moments later, when backup arrived, the police entered the house on Dorset Street. They found that both Leslie and Adrian had been stabbed to death. Both women were 26 years old. Here's what the police found during their investigation. It appeared as though Leslie was the first victim. She had died after being stabbed just a few times. Her room was closer to the top of the stairs than Adrian's room. After killing Leslie, the killer attacked Adrian. There was a massive fight as Adrian attempted to defend herself, but the killer managed to stab her several times. Blood from the killer was found in a few places, including on the window blinds, walls, and stairs. From the DNA, the police knew that the intruder was a man, but there was no match in the DNA databases. Cigarette butts were found in both the front and back yards of the house. The killer smoked an unusual brand of cigarettes called Camel Turkish Gold. The police investigated everybody they could think of who could have been involved in the murders, including former and current romantic interests of Leslie. They ruled out over 200 men who provided DNA samples. The police asked Lauren Minza if she knew anyone who smoked cigarettes. She remembered that Lily's boyfriend, Eric Koppel, was a smoker. On September 22, 2005, the police left a message at Eric's residence. That same day, they publicly released information about the cigarette butts, including the name of the unusual brand. Five days later, on September 27, Eric went to a police station and confessed to the murders. Here is the story he supplied to investigators. On Halloween night, Eric and his girlfriend, Lily, were at the home of friends. Eric was drinking excessively. He said something that embarrassed Lily. In response, she drove him to the apartment that they shared and left him there alone. Lily went to spend the night at her parents' home. 
After sleeping for a while, Eric woke up and retrieved a knife and zip ties. He drove to the house on Dorset Street. He smoked cigarettes for a few minutes outside. As he was standing there, the motion sensor on the house turned the light on and off. Eric pried open a window with a knife. This wasn't difficult because the window was unlocked. He could hear a dog growling as he entered the house. Eric made his way upstairs and fell asleep on a pile of clothes in a bedroom. He remembered a light being turned on and making eye contact with Adrian. At this point, he blacked out. Eric did not remember stabbing anyone. He only had flashes of memory. Eric did, however, recall driving home, building a fire in a fire pit, and burning all of his clothing. On December 5, 2006, Eric Koppel pleaded guilty to two counts of first-degree murder. Just over a month later, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Eric Koppel was a land surveyor. He did not have a criminal record. He was described as depressed, obsessive-compulsive, neat, shy, and unremarkable. People who knew him said that he would just blend in with the scenery. He did not stand out for any reason, good or bad. Item number two. Adrian and Eric Koppel's girlfriend, Lily, were best friends and co-workers. Adrian was not a fan of Eric. She thought that he was not good enough for Lily. Eric and Lily were supposed to be married on November 1, 2004, in Hawaii. This is the same day that he committed the murders. It appeared as though Eric's world revolved around Lily, and he was highly threatened by Adrian's involvement in his relationship. Maybe he blamed Adrian for Lily's decision to cancel the wedding. When Adrian and Lily planned a trip to Australia the same month when Eric was supposed to be getting married, it just pushed him over the edge. Item number three. Three months after Eric committed the murders, he married Lily. It would appear as though they had patched up their relationship. I guess everything worked out for Eric in the end, except for the double homicide part. Eventually, Eric's conscience started to bother him. He wrote notes to family members saying that he had a dark side that no one knew about. I think it's also likely that Eric realized the police were going to arrest him eventually. They were going to connect him to the crime through his DNA. At his sentencing, Lily spoke on Eric's behalf, even though he was going to get life in prison either way. She talked about how Eric had come to talk to her about something that was bothering him. She said to him, there is nothing in the world you can do to make me love you less. Lily said these words are just as true as they were on that afternoon. Lily believed it was inexplicable how a fine man could be responsible for such a terrible crime. Nothing in Eric's past indicated the potential for violence. She blamed his difficult family situation, depression, and alcohol. Item number four. Eric spoke at his sentencing. He claimed that he was a broken man who had been splintered by a penetrating awareness of his own potential for wickedness. He was sorry for the terrific agony that inflicted through his sinful deeds. Eric said that he had experienced several traumatic events in rapid succession. This fertilized the seed of anger in his heart. Eric maintained that his vague and incomplete confession was true. He stood by his story of unexplained and improbable memory loss. This, of course, is impossible to believe. I think Eric was just trying to escape embarrassment, like he did not want to describe all the details about his behavior. Eric burned all his clothing after committing the murders. Clearly, he remembered what happened. Item number five. I think there are elements of this case which will remain a mystery because Eric was not forthcoming. His intended target was Adrian, but the exact reason he killed her may never be known. For example, why was he carrying zip ties? Was there a sexual motive involved in this case? There are a few possibilities regarding Eric's motive. He wanted revenge. He wanted to get rid of a person who was distracting Lily. I think it's also possible that Eric thought that Adrian's death would create a bonding opportunity between him and Lily. Not long after the murder, he went to console Lily. I believe that Eric went to the house on Dorset Street intending to kill Adrian, 
but ended up in the wrong room. This is why he murdered Leslie. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Item number six, the police and many other people thought that Leslie was the killer's target. Leslie was outgoing and being chased by many different men, whereas Adrian was not as popular. Some of the men who were pursuing Leslie were engaged in behavior that could be considered stalking. Many men regularly gave her expensive gifts, and Leslie was receiving money in unmarked envelopes. It's interesting how Leslie's romantic life affected the events in this case, even though it was unrelated to the motive. Leslie's vigorous interest in dating led investigators down the wrong path, but her behavior also played a part on the night of the murders. As I mentioned, Lauren initially assumed that the man who entered the house was one of Leslie's love interests. If she had not believed that, she probably would have called for help immediately. Now moving to my final thoughts. This story attracted a lot of attention due to its brutal nature and its timing. It occurred right after Halloween. One theme of Halloween is how certain entities can be frightening. Ghosts, skeletons, zombies, children dressed up as Kim Kardashian. In the case of Eric Koppel, he was the last person anyone would have suspected. Scary was not a word used to describe him. He was so reserved, people barely recognized that he existed. I think the theme of this case is how relying on fear to protect people is not logical. Often people do not know who to fear. Eric did not appear dangerous, but beneath the surface he was lethal. There was a skeleton in his closet, which did not give his victims a ghost of a chance. Those are my thoughts on the Napa Valley Halloween murder case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.